If Zuko entered into a relationship with Katara, he would likely not be intending to change the world. He's tired of having his life dictated by demands of what he should do or what he must do. He would simply be committing to someone who understands his alienation and anxiety and his desire to be better. They empathize with each other and want to take care of each other, but their relationship would, nonetheless, change the world. Zuko's foremost task upon ascending to the throne is to reform the structure and philosophy of the Fire Nation. The state apparatus runs on blood and conquest and the machinery needed to do so, and it has for over a century. Warfare is the perfect business if you can get into it. As Varric says in Korra, if you can't make money during war, you just can't make money. If someone buys a cell phone, for instance, it'll be a while before they need to replace it. Sure, you can say, Oh, this new one is so much better. That old one is so out of date, you need to replace it. But you still need people to buy into that ideology. That ideal of always chasing the next best thing. But in war, it's more objective. There will always be a need for more bullets and tanks and guns. Concurrent with the military shift needed, though, is the cultural shift. You have to take a country that has only known war with these other nations and convince it to unite with these other nations. And if Zuko and Katara are married, you have to sell the people on this shift while also convincing them to accept that the wife of their new leader is from a tribe of people that they, the Fire Nation citizens, had been taught to consider savages. I'm not saying it can't be done. It can, but it's not easy. And to make matters more complicated, the Fire Nation is a hereditary monarchy. At the end of The Legend of Korra, it is the last hereditary monarchy in the world, as Prince Wu starts to implement plans for dismantling the monarchy of the Earth Kingdom. Because of this, it absolutely does matter who the Fire Lord marries. Zuko and Katara's kids would be of mixed Fire Nation and Water Tribe ancestry. Because of this, it's possible that the next Fire Lord would not be a Firebender at all. It's even possible that this next Fire Lord could be a Waterbender. This would be a shock to the people of the Fire Nation, as the cultural identity of the nation is so heavily tied to Firebending. Zhao even calls fire the so-called superior element, in episode 113, The Blue Spirit, and there is no reason to believe that this is not a commonly held view. It would be hard enough to accept Katara, but the image of a waterbender sitting in the future on the Fire Nation throne might be enough to incite an uprising. People are already scared and anxious in the Fire Nation. They've lost the war, and they feel that a foreign and callous government is being imposed on them by the victors of the war. In the comic trilogy, Smoke and Shadow, May's father attempts to lead the New Ozai Society, a group of ultra-royalists attempting to remove Zuko and put his father Ozai back on the throne. Zuko admits at the end of the trilogy that he made mistakes that gave the good people of the Fire Nation reason to distrust his leadership capabilities, but one has to question whether his individual behavior would have been enough to prevent a backlash. The transition Zuko is trying to bring about is the same transition that happened between the wartime militaristic Japanese government and the pacifist 
post-war government of that country, and that transition was not easy either. Zuko would certainly not make things easier on this front by marrying Katara and having kids with her. The whole problem of Zuko and Katara's waterbending child possibly ascending to the throne of a nation of very proud firebenders could be solved if the monarchy were simply abolished. Though I would hate to see two characters I really love and appreciate and respect bow to the whims of angry nationalists. It might better fit the ideas of Avatar The Last Airbender if Zuko and Katara at least took steps toward reforming the monarchy as an institution. Avatar The Last Airbender depicts a series of hierarchical patriarchal systems. And I mean patriarchy in the truest sense of the word, as in a powerful older male figure ruling while trying to present himself as a knowing and compassionate father figure. The Fire Nation appears ruled by what we call absolute primogenitor. This means that there is no preference for sons over daughters in terms of deciding who ascends to the throne. Aside from Azula, all the Fire Lords we see in the series are male, but this does not mean that has always been the case. There is no rule saying that women can't be Fire Lords, or that or even that male heirs are preferred, and indeed we see Azumi ascending to the throne of the Fire Nation by the Legend of Korra. But the actual hereditary system of the Fire Nation is not really what we're talking about here. I'm talking about seeing the structure of the Fire Nation through Zuko's eyes. We care about the Fire Lord because we care about Zuko's fraught relationship with him, not because we have an innate investment in Ozai, which is a major reason why the final battle between Aang and Ozai falls a little bit flat for me. For Zuko, the Fire Lord is this callous patriarch who inspires respect by inspiring fear. By the militaristic, cold value system Ozai instills in Zuko, Ozai is a good father because he demands that his son value duty and honor. But as Zuko grows, he rejects this value system. He realizes that there are more important things than honoring one's father and one's country. For example, honoring truth and honoring the good of one's fellows. By the midpoint of season three, Zuko no longer respects or fears his father, instead viewing him as a bitter, immoral tyrant. Ozai tries to reinforce the hierarchical relationship between them, hurling insults at Zuko when Zuko tries to oppose him. But Zuko will not be denied, he will not be silenced. What he rejects is not just his father as a person, but his father's entire value system. Traditional blood relations are not what is to Zuko most important. He recognizes his uncle, Iroh, as the real father figure in his life, and he joins the non-hierarchical Team Avatar. Aang may be the Avatar, but the members of this team all need each other to thrive and function, and they recognize this. No one is more important than anyone else. It is horizontally, rather than vertically, structured. This is not the only assault we see on systems that prioritize family lineage and father figures. Toph's family may not have burned her face like Zuko's father did, but like Zuko's father, Toph's family rejects her basic nature. They try to make her into someone she is clearly not. They force her into a role she refuses to play, and by the end of episode 206, 
the blind bandit, she leaves. Team Avatar has given her a way out. So she takes that way out. Yes, she misses her parents. Who wouldn't in her situation? Especially considering how young she is. But she is not under their control anymore. When her father finally accepts her in the comics that take place after the end of the series, he accepts her for who she is. He no longer is trying to force her into being someone else entirely. Even in the case of Sokka and Katara, we see the authority of the father give way. Hakoda is not cruel like the fathers of Zuko and Toph, but he nonetheless has to yield and allow the younger generation to take control of the invasion. When he's out of prison near the end of the show, it is because of Sokka and Suki and Zuko's ingenuity, not because of his own prowess as a warrior. And it's Sokka and Katara who are the ones that finally defeat the Fire Nation at the end of the show. Sokka engineers the defeat of the airship fleet, and Katara helps Zuko defeat Azula. After this, it's a little disappointing to see the commitment to hereditary monarchies, to the passage of power from father to son after the end of the show. That the Earth Kingdom has a monarchy becomes a problem in Season 3 of The Legend of Korra, as the monarch turns out to be a terrible tyrant. Now, obviously, the Fire Nation monarchy is not like that in the original timeline, and it certainly would not turn out like that if Zuko and Katara got married and had kids. Now, of course it is impossible to know for sure, but Zuko and Katara are both caring and empathetic people who have seen enough darkness and shadow and trauma to recognize the value of light and caring and goodness. They would raise their kids with the utmost care and affection and consideration. Likely these kids would be beautiful inside and out. Of all the reasons to support the Zuko and Katara pairing, the fact that they look good together would not for me be in the top 10 or even in the top 20, but yes, they do look good together. They have great genes. The image of one of their beautiful kids possessing both Fire Nation and Water Tribe ancestry, leading the Fire Nation into the future, is a beautiful scenario. But we have to ask ourselves whether it's right to put so much pressure on these kids. They did not ask to rule, it was not up to them. They did not ask to be judged by the hyper-nationalist standards of the Fire Nation. But if the hereditary monarchy still exists, they would have to bear this pressure. In The Legend of Korra, we see the burden of having to bear the weight of such a vast legacy in the character of Tenzin. He didn't ask to be the one who has to uphold the legacy of Aang, the last airbender who defeated the Fire Nation and formed the United Republic, but as the only airbending child of Aang and Katara, he kind of has to. And it afflicts him with anxiety and misery. He internalizes the pressure placed on his shoulders. But though he views himself primarily as Aang's successor, he is not Aang, and he finally has to confront this in the fog of lost souls. He recognizes that he has to be his own person, that he can't keep living in the shadow of his father. If he does, he will always be consumed by guilt that he's not good enough. But he is not just Aang Part 2. He is Tenzin. When he fulfills his dream of helping bring back the Air Nation by the end of Season 3, he does so by relying on his own instincts 
and those of his protege, Korra, not by trying to be like Aang. Similarly, how do you be the child of Zuko, the sullen prince who turned himself into a symbol of redemption so iconic that my entire generation measures redemption arcs by how they compare to Zuko's? And how do you be the child of Katara, though she was the daughter of a military and political leader in her tribe and thus not the lowly peasant that Zuko and Azula call her, she was nonetheless not destined for some grand fate. She inserts herself into this narrative by sheer force of will. She makes the choice to go with Aang. She makes the choice to keep the team together even when everyone's dying in the desert. If she did not join the group, they would not have survived. And it's worth noting that she almost convinces Zuko to join the cause at the end of Season 2. And how do you, as a child of theirs, grow up in the shadow of that relationship, knowing that Zuko and Katara started off as enemies, but that Zuko took a chance and tried to understand Katara's doubts and fears and traumas, and that even after he ends up betraying her, Katara finally forgives him and he endures her barrage of insults unfazed because he really wants to give her the catharsis that he knows she needs. How do you function in that legacy? How do you function in the shadow of such grand predecessors? Especially if you have to take the throne and you have known only peace. It does not help that from a very young age you have to be conscious of your behavior. You have to make sure you don't slip up. You have to make sure you act in such a way that does not cause the people of the Fire Nation who are waiting for you to slip up to doubt your honor or your allegiance to your country. Having the eyes of the world on you from a young age must be difficult. But imagine how much harder it would be if you had the extra layer thrown in of being a waterbender or a non-bender and knowing very clearly that the people of the Fire Nation are prejudiced against anyone who isn't a powerful firebender sitting on the throne of the Fire Nation. If the hereditary monarchy is still in place, Zuko and Katara would have to not only teach their kid to rule, but also how to weather the slings and arrows of nationalist criticism. That said, if anyone could do it, they could. They've constantly had to stand in opposition to those who don't or can't understand the moral obligations they feel and their impulse is to act against what could be considered their material self-interest in order to stand for what they believe is right and good and moral. It would not be easy to raise a kid who's secure in their moral convictions, who has a strong moral compass, but who never takes anything for granted. This kid would have to learn that the peaceful state of things had to be fought for, and that peace is by no means guaranteed. However, I cannot think of any better parents to learn this from than Zuko and Katara. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this. <laughs> Keep watching Avatar The Last Airbender. It is a brilliant, challenging, evocative, heartfelt show that is finally getting the respect it deserves. The world is so vivid and rich in detail that it's not hard to uh, picture alternate scenarios like this. I really love this show. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon. I promise you that. 
Thank y'all again. Adios, comrades.